of the party's right still in post because the PM's too weak to sack her, says Keir Starmer. The question really is for the Prime Minister. He's got a, a Home Secretary who's, who's out of control and he is too weak to do anything about it. But it's not just Labour criticising the Home Secretary's remarks. One former Cabinet Minister told me if she's trying to get sacked, I hope she succeeds. She's the first Home Secretary to contribute to public disorder. Another said, words fail me just beyond words and decency. And finally, a senior Tory source simply said, it's effing insane. To support, uh, the this former minister hinting she has to go. Do you think that the Home Secretary is being disloyal to the Prime Minister? I'm sure the Prime Minister will show the required leadership to get us through this weekend domestically, internationally and politically. When you say the required leadership, do you think he should sack his Home Secretary? I think that's a judgment to be made uh, for the Prime Minister himself. Too frequently, uh, I'm afraid, we've had taken our eye off the ball because of uh, uh, choice words from the Home Secretary. The Prime Minister's in an impossible position. If he doesn't sack Suella Braverman, he looks weak. And if he does, he risks a revolt from her supporters. Now, her backers tell me that you can't fire somebody in a row over words and that she hasn't actually broken any rules. So whether she stays or whether she goes comes down to a purely political judgment. And this is a Prime Minister that doesn't much like having to make those. Number 10 says the Prime Minister has full confidence in Suella Braverman, but in this building, his team are fuming that she's undermining their man. And tonight, they're working out how they rack Pramand, a Home Secretary he spent the past year trying to find ways not to sack. Beth Rigby, Sky News, Westminster. Well, Beth is here with us now. Mm. Beth, what's going on? Good question. <laughs> I mean, what a day. Yeah. What a day. Um, look, I think there's a few things to say. The first is that this is the latest in a long string of moments where uh, the Home Secretary has tested the Prime Minister's patience to a limit and he has not sacked her. Why? Mm. We know that he had a Faustian pact with her when he became Prime Minister. She lent her backers to him. Uh, his reward to her was making her Home Secretary. And there has been a sense in Westminster that she has been immovable. So she tests the limit, she challenges his authority, she says incendiary things and still she stays. And I think today she really is testing the limits. And the reason I say that is, number one, one of her key backers, Sir John Hayes, was on the WhatsApp groups as soon as this article landed last night, trying to back her up, perhaps because he knew that she had overreached and you are getting universal fury uh, from but a few Suella Braverman backers today in terms of uh, the Tory ranks. And number two, uh, when you speak to her backers, I mean, even one of her supporters acknowledged to me earlier, I'm just reading what they said to me, that some sort of reprimand or lesser sanction against the Home Secretary or her team that worked on the piece could be in order, given that Number 10 is looking into it. So um, what they're arguing is, well, you can't sack her over a war over words because she hasn't broken collective ca cabinet responsibility when it comes to policy. But I think the fact that they aren't sure what he's going to do shows that she is on thin ice. The, the final thing I would say, Sophie, is that, you know, as Rishi Sunak watches, what we do know is that he is a man that loves a process. So when it was Dominic Raab, when it was Nadeem Sahari, do you remember that? It went on for weeks. He said, I want to follow a process, I want to find the evidence, and then I will take make a judgment. And the difficulty he's got with this is this is a political judgment mm. because, you know, they're not having an informal investigation. Yes, they're looking at how it came about that the article was published despite Number 10 wanting changes. They've made it clear that they didn't sanction it. But that's different from a formal investigation about whether she broke the ministerial code. So it's on him. He has to make a political judgment. He doesn't like doing that. Uh, and the question I have really is that, yes, he could sack her, mm -hmm. but he will get a backlash from some of her backers, not least in grassroots grassroot membership, mm -hmm. who never voted for him to be prime minister in the first place. So I think we are in what I would say is a holding pattern. Mm -hmm. They've kind of put out... A marker saying we're looking into it. It's not the end of the story. There are rumours awash about a reshuffle and does he shuffle her out 
perhaps mm -hmm. next week. But I think it comes down to the nub of it is that she's challenged his authority again and again and again. He looks too weak to sack her. Mm. And if he does sack her, Labour will be able to say, we bounced him. So he is in a really, really, I think it, the phrase is a rock and a hard place, isn't it? It does feel um, But I don't think this is the end of it. I think that there will have to be, given that they have publicly said we didn't endorse it, some sort of sanction. You know these, sometimes you can do the thing where someone else uh, uh, falls on the sword, not her. Yeah. I would say it's a very live discussion at the moment. Yeah, we can, oh, it's going to be a fascinating one. I was in that camp. I was in the camp of thinking she was unsackable. Tonight, yeah, it's not. I it's it's not in as a different place. It's not as well. He's equivocated. Mm. He hasn't, you know. But he said, "I have full confidence." But I absolutely didn't endorse this article. Mm. Now that obviously is a bit of a party management issue, but that's also uh, a, re a rebuke to her publicly. Mm. Uh, Beth, thank you very much indeed. Well, a little earlier, I spoke to Caroline Noakes, the chair of the Women and Equalities Select Committee. Look, I think it's um, imperative that at a time like this, when there are clearly heightened tensions, that we're all careful about our language, that we all think about what we can do to bring communities together rather than drive them apart. And I very much hope that the Prime Minister at least speaks to the Home Secretary to explain the very significant concerns that are being raised across the party about the sort of language she has used over the past few days. So do you think that she is driving communities apart, as you put it? I think that the language that the Home Secretary has used has been misjudged. I am very worried that we will see heightened tensions this weekend on Armistice Day and Remembrance Sunday, which actually are times that we should all be able to come together as communities to commemorate those who gave their lives for us in war and... I just think that the Home Secretary could have thought more closely before she used the language that she did. I guess there will be people listening to us tonight who think they agree with Suella Brotherman, that, you know, when she says people who vandalise the Cenotaph should be jailed, when she criticises the way that the Met Police protest, there will be some people who think, yeah, she's right, isn't she? Well, this is the beauty of our democracy, isn't it, that we have freedom of speech, that we can all disagree, we can hold different views, we can uh, go on marches to highlight what our particular political or, uh, or other sort of opinion is, but it's crucially important that when we do that, we disagree in a respectful and uh, cordial manner. And I think that's the important thing, is that if there are protests, that they should be peaceful. Uh, if we're going to complain and disagree, with other uh, individuals that we should try to do so in a respectful manner. And I think that's the challenge that we're facing at the moment with the heightened tensions that we're seeing around the globe. It's a challenge to the Prime Minister as well, isn't it, though? Um, you know, putting the rights and wrongs to one side. Number 10 requested changes to an article written by the Home Secretary and she ignored number 10. I mean, there's no way Look, that she can let her stay, right? I don't know what the ins and outs were of the drafting of the article, whether it was approved by number 10 or not. I've had a, a busy constituency day. It may surprise you I haven't been following the Westminster gossip at all. Well, that's what number 10 are saying. They said that they requested changes and that they, didn't, they weren't made. Well, look, this is a matter that the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary need to resolve between themselves. And to be quite frank, I am absolutely convinced that they're not listening to mere backbenchers like me tonight. Oh, I don't know, Caroline, don't do yourself down. Um, just finally, um, I was just thinking, you know, um, you are talking there about the divisions between communities and the language, the importance of language that people use. You know, you stood on successfully uh, as an MP in 2001 and 2005. Now, that, that was at a time when, if you think about it, the Conservatives were perhaps seen as the nasty party. Are you worried that that might be happening again? And what does it mean for your electoral prospects? Well, look, I will continue doing exactly what I do day in, day out, 365 days of the year. I'll do my best to represent the people of Romsey and Southampton North to the best of my ability. Um, to be quite frank, I have been a Conservative candidate under many different leaders over the past, uh, gosh, you know, well in excess of 20 years now. Uh, and I think what matters is that I have the integrity to stand up for what I believe in, to support my constituents and to work incredibly hard. And I know up and down the country, that's what my fellow Conservative MPs are all doing. 
We'll be hearing more from Caroline Nakes a bit later on the Politics Hub tonight as well because she's been talking to us about an exclusive Sky News investigation into a culture of abuse in the UK's drama schools. But next tonight, now there was one quote in the Home Secretary's article yesterday which has perhaps provoked the strongest reaction in terms of criticism. And some people I've spoken to in Westminster tonight suspect that it was this section that Downing Street wanted changed. I'm just going to read it to you now. I do not believe that these marches are merely a cry for help for Gaza. They are an assertion of the primacy by certain groups, particularly Islamists of the kind we're more used to seeing in Northern Ireland. Also disturbingly reminiscent of Ulster are the reports that some of Saturday's march group organisers have links to terrorist groups, including Hamas. Well, our senior Ireland correspondent David Blevins joins us now from Dublin. Um, how are those remarks being received? Well, Sophie, we are live in Dublin tonight, but I suppose it feels like we're broadcasting from a parallel universe on a day when a UK Home Secretary doesn't appear to know the difference between unionists and nationalists in Northern Ireland. That's the obvious conclusion to draw from the comments in which she described those demonstrating in support of Palestine this weekend as hate marchers of the type we're more used to seeing in Northern Ireland, quote unquote. It is Protestants, unionists, loyalists, natural allies of the Tories who are responsible for 95% of marches in Northern Ireland. So to describe this as an own goal would be an understatement. Unionists have been choosing their words carefully today, some even defending the Home Secretary. That's because they wouldn't want to concede that someone at her level in government would be so ill-informed about Northern Ireland. But nationalists are not holding back. The SDLP leader described it as aggressive ignorance and the Sinn Féin President Mary Lou Macdonald uh, said Suella Braverman was at sea and ignorant about Northern Ireland and about the Middle East. Now, lots of people have asked me why the Irish are so interested in the Middle East and why they particularly affiliate with the Palestinian cause. To oversimplify, it's because they draw comparisons between their respective histories. You'll remember how strongly they felt about Boris Johnson breaching international law also over Brexit. You can imagine how they feel about Israel's response to the attack by Hamas. Mary Lou Macdonald, the Sinn Féin president, is the only political leader from from these islands to have met with Hamas. So it was significant when she condemned the attack, but she's equally passionate in her call for a ceasefire and says those two positions are not incompatible. Why does her view matter so much? Well, she's very likely to be the next Taoiseach, the next Irish Prime Minister. She'll make her pitch for that job at her party conference this weekend. And on the eve of that, she's been speaking exclusively to Sky News. Mary Lou Macdonald, there's really only one place we can start today. Suella Braverman, your instant reaction to the comparisons she made in The Times. Well, I, I think it demonstrates the extent to which the Tory government and she perhaps in particular is at sea and ignorant of Irish affairs um, and also how at sea and the distance between the Tory government and such a huge number of people in England and right across Britain. So I thought the remarks were extraordinary. Um, they were, uh, to say the least, uh, unhelpful in as much as in the end they are a distraction from a situation that could not be more serious. And I think it would suit her better and the government better to join with others and call for a ceasefire. A distraction for what purpose, though? What would you think her end game is? I, I don't know, uh, is the honest answer, but it strikes me that the government in London is uh, really at this stage a, a bit of a past master at a gratuitous insult. If the idea is simply to create a division or, or to uh, arouse controversy, uh, or to seek attention, well, then she has achieved those uh, objectives. Just this week, we heard a former Israeli government minister telling Palestinians they could go to the desert or go to Ireland. Many people beyond here are very surprised by how widespread and deep the affiliation is with the Palestinian people. Why is that? I think the, 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 uh, the connection with the people who were dispossessed, a, a people who to this day 
um, have their homes taken, their lands annexed, is a very deep one for historical reasons. But also in contemporary terms, I think we've learned the lesson here in Ireland of, of the necessity for peaceful coexistence, the primacy of international law. And as a small country, we know that strong multilateral institutions, adherence to international law, are good things for us. And anything that threatens that, in this case coming from Israel, um, is, 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 bad, is bad news. So what would you say to those who would see this as Ireland having an anti-Semitism problem? Absolutely not. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. And I think those people should listen to the voices of Jewish people across the world. In my view, incredible voices of bravery who are shouting for, demanding a ceasefire, who are saying very clearly, not in our name. And when you think about it, the Jewish community, community international is making that call from a place and an experience of collective trauma, of Holocaust. To the best of my knowledge, you're the only political leader from these islands to have met with Hamas. But it was a departure from the norm when you condemned the attack on Israel. At the same time, you're calling for a ceasefire. Is Sinn Féin riding two horses on this issue because you want to be seen as Taoiseach material, the next Prime Minister? No, no, no. I mean, just to be clear, um, Ireland is a, a non-aligned uh, and a military neutral. But we are not neutral when it comes to the issue of international law. And we're not neutral when it comes to the rights of Palestinian people to self-determination. We're not neutral when we say that Israel must be held to account for decades, generations of human rights uh, violations. We're very clear on that. And we also recognise that ultimately to get to a place of peace and settlement, you do have to have an inclusive uh, process. I mean, we've learned that in Ireland, haven't we? That's the only thing that works. Let's talk for a moment about Sir Keir Starmer. He says it's not time for a ceasefire. He says it's not time for a referendum on Irish unity. He's not Jeremy Corbyn, is he? And yet <laughs> he could be the next UK Prime Minister and you could be the next Irish Prime he Minister. He could be, um, and he's wrong on both of these questions. Um, certainly in respect of a ceasefire, um, a ceasefire is, is right and necessary and urgent at, at this point. In respect of the, the referendum on, on unity, uh, Keir Starmer will recall that uh, the Good Friday Agreement is very clear that it's for the people of Ireland without impediment or coercion in referendums to make that decision. So there will be referendums. It's a question of timing. And I think it's important that the British government, a British government, actually sets out how, in their mind, the timing might be judged. What's the tipping point for them? If you are the next Taoiseach, the next Irish Prime Minister, would you form a government with Fianna Fáil? <laughs> well, we have, to, we have to get through an election firstly, and I, I take nothing for granted. There are no inevitabilities. Um, but I do know that we have a chance for the first time to have a government without Fianna Fáil or Fine Gael. Now, that's not a yes or a no, is it a no. maybe? <laughs> it is a, a, a reassertion of my, my preference. My preference is for that government of change without Fianna Fáil or Fine Gael. But I also know that to form a government, the numbers have to add up. Just one final question. There is still no power-sharing government in Northern Ireland. And for a very long time, it's felt like Sinn Féin is saying to the DUP, you voted for Brexit, this is the consequence of Brexit. When do we move beyond that? Is there anything you can offer to the DUP to try and bring them back into the devolved government and see Michelle O'Neill installed as First Minister? Well, look, we are beyond uh, a lot, not all, of, of the Brexit dynamic. I mean, Brexit was for keeps. Brexit was ill-judged, ill-considered, and it had very negative consequences. So... I've said it. That's it. That's now done. And if, if I could offer the DUP one thing, we offer this, a prospect of working together collectively, constructively to get the job done. And I can only hope that Geoffrey Donaldson and the DUP grab that opportunity with both hands, albeit 18 months uh, later after the event, and come and let's, let's, get the, let's get the work done. That's the challenge for them. Mary Lou MacDonald, thank you very much. Thank you.
we'll also talk about next with our duo for tonight, Nick Ferrari and James Schneider. That's coming up next. I'm Stuart Ramsey and I'm Sky's chief correspondent. Well, there's a real sense now that people are beginning to expect that this whole airlift is coming to an end and they're really, really desperate. We saw snatch squads going in, grabbing people and putting them into trucks. You either live and recover or you die. OK, so that's like a war. That's the war, yes. Yeah. We help you understand the world with us. Over the past 24 hours, the soldiers have been attacked on a number of occasions. It's really sending a clear message that Venezuela is eager for change. We've been crushed. To take you to the heart of stories that shape our world. They were convinced the United States would become hooked. Well, they were right. An enormous explosion has just come down. I think it was a monster that just landed in between us. The information on this could bring down the entire network, not just in Iraq and Syria, but across the world. It's not out of control, but it's big withdrawn. It's so, so hot. Welcome back. Well, let's bring in tonight's duo, shall we? The broadcaster Nick Ferrari and James Schneider, who was Director of Strategic Communications to Jeremy Corbyn when he was leader at the Labour Party. Good to have you both with us. Right. Suella Braverman. James, is she going to go? I don't know, because I can't tell what's going on in Number 10, but they clearly don't have a grip. I mean, saying that um, they didn't approve of the article, which begs the question, what didn't you approve? They're just feeding this story and they should have an idea of where the line is because she's been pushing the line for about a year and Sunak's had to come out and say, no, I didn't agree with what she said about multiculturalism in that speech that she flew to the US to give a speech to the right of the Conservative Party, it seems, and to the British media. Um, so who knows? But he doesn't look like he's good at politics and he doesn't look like he's got a grip over, over the government at the moment. How much of a danger is there if she goes that he's actually created a martyr? Because remember, as and when, if, if as the polls suggest, the Conservatives are slowly moving towards a pretty ugly general election, they will need to elect a new leader. Mm -hmm. And we remember the people who actually vote, the people are far more right-wing, really, of yeah. the Conservatives, they're members, so they would go for someone like Suella Brahman. Let's be candid with each other. A lot of what she's saying has a degree, I think you reference yeah. this, has a degree of appeal out there. I think the handling of it has been calamitous. Uh, they should, so we don't know what it is they're unhappy about. That just looks awful. And as for Suella Bravman herself, well, clearly if she does go, there's a job for her running the defence at Manchester United. That's the sort of <laughs> clearly where she should go next. But I would imagine, to a degree, she's probably enjoying quite a lot of this. Because how can she... If, if he retains her, it increases her power. If she goes, I say again, I'll use the word because there's no other word for it, she's the martyr, isn't she? I think you're right, actually. I think, I think that there's almost more jeopardy here for the Prime Minister than mm. for De Suella Bravo. Definitely. I mean, she's been auditioning to be the leader of the opposition for the last year, basically, and exactly as Nick says... And by leader of the opposition, you mean if the Conservatives lose Absolutely. the election... I mean, I, I mean e you know, everyone knows, of course, weird things can happen, but there's, like, a 99% chance that the Conservatives lose the next election, and 
you know, she, this is, you see this criticism from people on the right of the Conservative Party. Like Priti Patel is very critical of, of Suella Braverman because she isn't doing the job of governing in the, uh, in the Home Office. She's auditioning to be leader of the opposition. And like Nick says, if she stays, she gets to audition from the pulpit of being yeah. Home Secretary. Otherwise, she gets to go and she gets to be on the back benches and say, it was Rishi that stopped me from doing whatever mad thing that she says that she would have done if, she, if the leash was off. And let's what remember. Let's not forget what this is about. One of the most solemn days in the calendar of this country's history, when widows and widowers and mums and dads stop to think because they've lost husbands or wives or they've lost their children. I know Remembrance Sunday is the next day. <coughs> excuse me, but Armistice Day is actually the Saturday, and that is what's the very heart of it. And this extraordinary conservative cluster shambles that they now have has taken all that out of there. It is cluster utter... shambles, nicely mm. Yes, chosen don't worry, I know you're nervous for a second. <laughs> I can see those eyes. Where's he going with this one? Remember, Nick, it's live. And this is absolutely disgraceful because of the memory that has been tarnished. Mm. It's very difficult for them to walk away from this. It does feel, to be honest, taking a step back and thinking about the importance of the news, the world news that yep. we've been seeing and the war in the Middle East that we have spent so many days this week talking about um, the... The and these are the people who are meant to try and bring calm, you know? These are the people who are trying to persuade everybody, look, you're going to have your demonstration, you're going to be one mile away from the people who are trying to remember the 11th hour of the armistice. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they are just pouring buckets of gas of petrol over it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that I think... Um, but she's been doing that all, all week, try, basically pre presenting as if the march is going to go near the Cenotaph, it's going nowhere near... The organisers of the demonstration, they don't want to disrupt anything to do with Armistice Day. They're not trying to cause uh, trouble in that sense. They just want to raise the voice for, uh, for peace. And, yeah, the, it's the opposite from what the Home Secretary should be doing. You know, the Home Secretary getting into rows with the police, claiming that the police is doing left-wing policing. And these are not... If you are... Unless you're Suella Braverman, if you're Home Secretary, that's not the headlines that you want. This time next week, is she going to be Home Secretary? Anyone um, willing to take a position? Yeah, I'll take a bet. I'll, I'll have a 50 quid bet with you and money goes to charity. I'll say she will. You think she will? Yeah, I will. I'll take that bet with you. Uh, yeah, all right, you're on. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we... Uh, uh, here you go. Uh, money goes to the police, widows and orphans. There you go. All right, yeah. done. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Uh, we obviously don't endorse uh, gambling on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we'll see what happens with that one. Coming up next on the <laughs> Politics Hub... We'll bring you an exclusive report on the culture in the UK's top drama schools and get reaction from the chair of the Commons Women and, Equal Women and Equalities Committee. That's Caroline Lex.
Hello and welcome back to the Politics Hub. Now I want to bring you an exclusive investigation now because Sky News has heard from over 50 drama school students who allege experiences of misconduct and harassment in some of the industry's leading institutions. Former students say their time at the school is less than feeling broken and humiliated. One school has now launched an internal investigation as a result of the allegations being brought to their attention. A warning that this report from Ashna Harinang does contain content viewers might find distressing. They are where dreams of stardom become reality. In Agprov, we do obviously singing, dancing, acting. Britain's drama schools are elite and fiercely competitive, but student allegations of misconduct within them pervade through these prestigious walls. I always felt unsafe, but I thought that that was a good thing. Holly, whose identity we've hidden, is a former acting student at the East 15 Drama School who has never forgotten an interactive sensory-based lesson set in an 18th century brothel. We were blindfolded in this experience and guided by our fellow actors in the other cast. Our hands were placed on our breasts, bums and bulges. We then had two smells. The first smell, one of the guys in the group had masturbated into his boxes and his boxes essentially were held to our noses and we were told to inhale. A moment she says was degrading. I was very taken aback by that shocking experience of having someone hold a cloth to my nose and tell me to breathe in and it being sperm. For the other smell, I had my head lowered into a bucket, which one of the guys in the group had vomited into. Cruel and questionable teaching practices shared by performing arts student Hannah at another school, whose name we've also changed. She says one teacher had students performing deep tissue massages on each other. He would say things like, try that harder, try that deeper, and he'd watch and just kind of like snigger to himself. One former drama school principal says the vulnerability of students is being abused. If you're in a, an acting class, you're talking, you're exploring life, you're exploring people. It just all spills out, creating very vulnerable adults. And the risk is that that could be exploited? The risk is that it is being exploited. We've spoken to over 50 drama school students, past and present from various schools, and all have shared similar trauma brought on by experiences of harassment and misconduct. Training is intrinsically linked with industry, and there is a perpetual fear of speaking out. And when careers are on the line, reporting anything negative can come with risk. Formal complaints are dealt with internally, but Anne-Marie says independent oversight is necessary for the training industry to change. I would want there to be something outside of all the established colleges because by default they're all getting investigated in-house. Well, th there's going to be a vested interest in so many things other than the student. We've spoken to many students and those in the industry as part of this investigation. A spokesperson from the University of Essex, which oversees East 15, says they have updated guidance on conduct and consent, which has been in place since 2021. In a statement, they told us, we are appalled by the issues that have been raised, which do not reflect the values of our university and East 15. This case was not reported in 2014, but having had this brought to our attention, we are appointing an independent reviewer to complete a full investigation into these very serious allegations. We do not tolerate harassment and bullying of any kind. We actively encourage students to speak out if they have any issues and to report incidents. All of England's leading drama schools are overseen by the Office for Students. The independent regulator is currently seeking to address sexual misconduct in all higher education institutions. But campaigners say this industry needs specific guidance to pierce through this unique environment. Ashna Harinag, Sky News. Well, earlier I got reaction from Caroline Noakes, the chair of the Women and Equality Select Committee. From the work that my select committee's done, we've seen that the entertainment industry in general has significant problems with uh, not exclusively young people, but particularly young women being very vulnerable to this sort of behaviour, which ultimately leads to uh, damage to their careers and, uh, as the report says, a culture of being afraid to say no. And it's absolutely terrifying that years after Me Too, years after everyone's invited, we're still not managing to protect students adequately. Does the regulation need to catch up? 
I think there's a lot that needs to catch up. First and foremost, we need to see better regulation. We need to see an understanding from this sort of educational institution that they have a responsibility to safeguard still relatively young people. They may be over 18, but they're still young. And also, we have to have cultural change. We cannot have a situation where, whether it's lecturers, whether it's fellow students, whether it's uh, individuals themselves feeling that it's okay to touch people inappropriately, that it's okay to use language that is belittling and demeaning. And to be quite frank, some of the stories in the report were just horrific, with one girl saying she wanted to be knocked over by a car on her way to college to get away from the abuse. There has to be better reporting mechanisms. There has to be a mechanism which can hold people to account and protects young people from this sort of harassment that can last for the rest of their lives, the damage that's done. Like you say, the particular stories are really, really troubling. Do you feel that things are getting better or are we just not making the progress that you think we should be seeing in this area? No, I think, bizarrely, we are making progress. I think particularly young women are being empowered to speak up. They are refusing to be silenced. It still takes a phenomenal act of bravery to be prepared to do so, but I think we are slowly seeing a cultural shift. And men have an important role to play in that through allyship and through supporting their classmates and calling out appalling misconduct when they see it. But what we don't have in place is what I would regard as robust structures that women feel confident about. So it's still the exceptional individual who's brave enough, as opposed to any sort of mass movement of people prepared to come forward to make sure that this is stamped out. Caroline Noakes talking to me there. Now, I just want to pause for a minute because we've got some breaking news on Alison Rose's payoff from leaving NatWest. You might remember she was at the centre of the Nigel Farage debanking scandal. Our city editor, Mark Kleinman, has more. Mark, what can you tell us? Yeah, that's right, Sophie. I understand that the board of NatWest will announce tomorrow morning the details of Dame Alison Rose's severance package. And my understanding is, is that the board... Uh, chaired by Sir Howard Davis, has decided to cancel the bulk of a potential £10 million plus payout. Now, uh, the unvested or the share awards that Dame Allison had been awarded, but which had not yet materialised, they will be cancelled. They amounted to more than £5 million. But I do understand that Dame Allison will still receive a seven-figure sum in accordance with the terms of her departure and that will come in the form of her basic salary. She will be paid out uh, the rest of her 12 months notice period. And that will probably amount to somewhere, something in the region of uh, two million pounds. So I don't think that this uh, payoff, which will be announced tomorrow, is going to be uh, without controversy, particularly given the extent of the political acrimony that resulted from the decision to close Nigel Farage's accounts with Coots. Now, you may remember, of course, Sophie, that uh, Dame Allison acknowledged that she had discussed Mr Farage's banking arrangements with a BBC journalist and had given him the impression that his accounts were being closed for commercial reasons only. It subsequently emerged that that wasn't the case. And this is a, a scandal, really, which has engulfed uh, regulators, including the F Financial Conduct Authority and the Information Commissioner's Office, which had to apologise uh, to Dame Allison this week. Uh, tomorrow, the NatWest board will hope to draw a, under, under, a line under this affair, uh, but it remains to be seen whether this, uh, the details of what we will get confirmed tomorrow morning to the London Stock Exchange will be enough to do that. OK, Mark, thank you very much indeed. Mark Kleinman there. Well, Sam Cates has also got an update uh, this evening, uh, our Deputy Political Editor, on the Suella Braverman situation. Um, Sam, what's the news? What's the breaking news? Uh, you might get me on the trace description there, Sophie. It's more like breaking no news. Um, I am told that we are now not going to get anything less, uh, anything else tonight, which means that you've sort of drawn a line under where we are today. Attention focuses on tomorrow and Monday. Just in 30 seconds to go through the options for Downing Street now, they are potentially looking at a reshuffle. 
Now, this has been long planned. A bigger reshuffle has been long planned, potentially involving other people from the cabinet, as Therese Coffey. Um, now, can he do it tomorrow? Uh, can Rishi Sunak wait until Monday? Could Suella Braverman resign over the weekend because she can see the writing on the wall? There's a hearing on Rwanda, the result of the Supreme Court judgment on Rwanda on Wednesday. She might go at that point too. It's very messy. I think they're gaming out different scenarios in number 10, but we could get change quite imminently, but not tonight. Change imminently, but not tonight. Thanks for the intel, uh, Sam. Imminently, but not tonight. What do you reckon that means for the kind of betting that was going on earlier then? Nick and James are with us. Imminently, I think they haven't got a bloody clue what they're <laughs> going to do. They haven't got an idea to bless themselves with at the moment. They are scrambling and scrambling and they don't really know and they're going to try and divine. They probably want to sleep on it. And I take from what Beth Rigby said earlier, and I think that was a very good point, this is a man who loves a process, isn't it? We've seen this time and time again. If he can find a way to knock it into... I'm missing sporting metaphors here. Knocking the ball into the long grass, I think he'd go for that. But I hear what Sam's just said. But I think that's going to be different. I mean, if you go to bed now, if they draw a line under it now, then something happens in the morning and they're leaving themselves open to uh, the story getting further away from them, new details coming out. Uh, and so, you know, they do have to take a decision fairly quickly, I think. Mm. Otherwise... It would, you know, they'll just be talking about this all weekend. This will be on what's on the Sunday shows, people's responses. Well, how does... It, I mean, what might happen if it kicks off? And let's hope it doesn't on Saturday. And let's hope everybody goes to their demonstration and, and, and demonstrates for peace and humanitarian causes and people remember them on, on Armistice Day. But if it does kick off, where does that leave Suella Braverman mm. with the comments that she's made? I would have thought the ice is even thinner, isn't it? Mm. So the events on Saturday are key. It's, it's, it is fascinating, isn't it? Um, I'm keen to get your opinions a bit more widely on Suella Braverman as well. Um, look, James, I'm sure you're not exactly a political bedfellow of Suella Braverman. You probably disagree with her on just about everything. Um, but do you think she's useful politically and electorally for the Conservative Party? I think a version of her could have been because Rishi Sunak codes sort of quite uh, sort of technocratic managerial and she gives the sort of the, the right wing mm. dog whistly type stuff. But if it's well managed, you can do those two things at the same time. So a bit like in the Leave campaign, you had the two different Leave campaigns and they had different messages and that worked well mm. together. But I think she's causing more trouble to the Prime Minister, like you said, making him look like he's not in control of his own government. And I think that is a net negative electorally. Well, you'd certainly want her in the tent, you knowing what out and outside the tent, yeah. putting it in, wouldn't you? The way she's Honestly, behaving you're at the really, you're really <laughs> good. I did say shambles. Complete, complete. <laughs> that was always always under control. Um, look, she's put there. For, as, absolutely right. She's there for a certain part of the party, isn't mm. she? She appeals to them. Uh, if she wasn't there, you'd probably need someone who had those similar views. Mm. Look, I've got to tell you, when I speak to uh, the listeners on my radio show, there are some people who actually buy into what she says. They do support mm. programs such as Rwanda. They do have issues. I think the homelessness one is pretty difficult to run. That was a very very strange one. But most of the others, there are people who will sign up to it. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know who the homeless thing was directed at. That was completely... Uh, that seems completely this barmy to me. This is said home, being homeless. Yeah, sorry, was yeah. Yeah. Lifestyle lifestyle and, and, and talking, uh, which then didn't get into the, no. into the King's speech, talking about um, uh, stopping charities from giving tents to homeless people and banning uh, homeless people from being in tents and changing the Vagrancy Act. I mean, really weird stuff, which... As you'd say, some of the things she's saying, there is a constituency yes, for is. it. Yeah. But, for, but for that, there's no one saying, oh, you know, the real problem in this country, too many of those charities giving tents yeah. to homeless people. But you're right. I guess, you know, for example, she told uh, my, my colleague uh, Alice Fortescue uh, over the weekend that anyone who vandalises the sen cenotaph should be jailed faster than their feet could touch the ground. And, and you're right that there would be people who think... But, oh, but, 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 the, but the reason why she shouldn't have said that, and it was so inflammatory, and it's inflammatory for what will happen on Saturdays, it made people think that mm. there is a real threat, that the, that the, the, the demonstrators are in some way going near the cenotaph, mm. that there's been some threat towards it, which is not true. So you can understand people at home hearing that going, mm. oh, no, we have to go out and defend the cenotaph. And you can see how you could get, you could get a much more febrile atmosphere when, you know, really what the, the job of the Home Secretary should yes. be to say yeah. is, we, uh, I don't agree with these protests, but 
uh, we have a we have pro right to protest in this country. It's going to be sensibly policed, like we have sensibly policed everything else, and blah blah blah. That's that should be and the your job. point about what happens over the weekend, and particularly on Saturday. I think that's a real cause of concern. Concerned. Absolutely. I mean, Sir Mark Rowley, probably the Commissioner of the Met, sorry, is probably feeling slightly a relieved man now because all the heat that went away from the fairly testy meeting we understand he had with the Prime Minister yesterday, the clear stance that Home Secretary was taking, that now in a way, Sir Mark can sit at Scotland Yard. Well, <laughs> actually, the focus is on someone else for a while. At least I get the night off. Very fair. Uh, thank you both uh, for your analysis this evening. Still to come on the Politics Hub. Nadine Dorries has a new book out. Is it destined for the bestseller list or the bargain bin? We'll see if our panellists can guess some of our mystery authors. Uh, this gives uh, Harry Potter fans a front row seat on one of the most iconic routes in the world. Um, voted regularly the best scenic route in the world, and, and so this is a chance to join ScotRail and train to be a driver uh, on this route. Uh, we're recruiting for trained drivers across ScotRail, and many of, the, of those roles involve working on our most scenic routes. But this one really is the, the top of the heap. Uh, it's absolutely iconic to drive over. Uh, the training that we give is extensive because it's a skillful role. It means driving in all weathers over these routes, which can present some very challenging weather conditions. But uh, it really does give you a great chance to see these routes at their best throughout the year. We provide training for anyone. We're looking for people from all walks of life to join us. Uh, we've had drivers join us in Scotland recently from all sorts of backgrounds, uh, young and old and so forth. Uh, we give a, a full training package. It can take up to 18 months to train a driver, uh, given the knowledge required, given the skill involved, given the technical aspect of it. But no, we absolutely welcome applications from anyone for these roles. There is a rigorous assessment process before you get to training. Once you're in, we give you an absolutely full training that covers both the technical side of it and out on the line itself. Uh, learning how to drive the route in all weathers. Th that's given the route a huge boost in popularity. Uh, it's a route that's extremely busy through the summer. It used to be quiet in winter. Uh, it's maybe more of a lifeline route through the winter for the local communities. But we are seeing more and more people come to see the route all year round. Uh, and seeing it in the winter with snow and the frost and so forth, it's just as good as seeing in the summer bathing sunshine. Mm. Uh, plus, of course, the odd rain shower that Scotland brings. So the, the Harry Potter film really has boosted that. Uh, we are looking to see how we can improve the services in the route. And that's one reason why we're looking for new drivers to join us mm. and play the part in uh, this huge success story. Um, is there a platform nine and three quarters to get to the to the train? Well, there's one at King's Cross to, to get to Scotland, but uh, there's not <laughs> in Scotland so far, so maybe that's something we'll take a look at. Hello, welcome back. You're watching The Politics Hub. Now, there's one thing Westminster likes. It's a political book launch. The launch party, the champagne, the free copies. But this week, we had one of the political book launches of the year. With Nadine Dorries making both waves and headlines with her account of her time in government. She called it The Plot. And in it, she claims that for the last two dec decades, British politics has been secretly controlled by a shady faction. Well, here on The Politics Hub, it got us thinking about some of the more notable books written by political figures in the modern era. So, I hope you're ready, guys, because I'm sure you are both extremely well-read. We've got a little quiz for you. Very simple, very simple. Uh, I'll read you an extract from a political book of the past, and you guys have to tell me who the author is. I've also had put a few clues in as well, because I think oh. some of these are a bit tricky. Right, James, this is the first one, oh, right? <laughs> this is the sentence. This is the extract from the, from the book. Then horses were backed, bets made, and there was loud and frequent calls for brimming goblets from hurrying waiters, distracted by the lightning and deafened by the peal. Now, this is a former Conservative Prime Minister. Mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so it seems. Uh, the, language quite old. the language is quite old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Can I have another clue? Yeah, yeah. He also shared, served as Chancellor and Leader of the House of Commons. I mean, a lot of them did that. Um, um, uh, and he became Prime Minister in 1874. Disraeli. Disraeli. Oh, well done. That was good. Yeah, <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. Right, OK, Nick Ferrari. Uh, right, here we go. 
He would have to do what he always did in such situations. Let the cards decide. Let the cards decide. OK, um, so who's been well-known? Who's been a gambling man? Um, that well-known laugh-a-minute gambler, Gordon Brown. <laughs> <laughs> It's not Gordon Brown. Oh, damn, I lose a point. It's a fiction, it's a political Is it thriller. Jeff Archer? No. Oh, 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 no. oh yeah. There we go. Okay, House of Cards yeah. by Michael, Michael Dobbs. Yeah, good bloke. Okay, James. I wish, said Frank Bridges venomously, that someone would sort out the bloody cow once and for all. Uh, an MP from 1983 to 1997. That is Jeffrey Archer. No, it's a junior health minister. Oh, uh, Jonathan Aitken? It's a female. Virginia Bottomley? No. Go on, let's give it. Let's give the answer. Edwina Curry? Good. Edwina yeah, Curry. Just in time. There we go. There we go. Just in time, this honourable oh, house. Uh, right, Nick. Uh, more of these. It's time. <laughs> it's I get time. up at half five in the morning, Sophie. I can't even remember my address at the moment, let alone anything else. <laughs> it's time for Haig, proclaimed the T-shirt. Oh, this was written by another former Prime Minister early in their political career. It's time for Haig, proclaimed the T-shirt. Uh, 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 this... It's a fiction book. They were born in 1964 and they were elected to Parliament in 2001. It's not Boris, is it? Boris Johnson. Oh, Very Boris good. <laughs> right. There we go. 72 Virgins by you, Boris Johnson. You should know. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's OK. Rather do... I mean, it's not the only dubious thing in that book. James. <laughs> Europeans don't get on. It's as simple as that. It's a shame, really, but we all know it's true. Oh. Now, this person became a news reporter at the Daily Mirror in 1981. They also worked at The Sun and Live TV. They became a radio talk show presenter in 1999. And they're also a Leicester, Leicester City fan. You've got Yay! it. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> and the final one, Nick. Oh, no. <laughs> there we go. I was so young in those days. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> to keep the possibilities open and turn winning from a distant hope into a reality, we must use the coming years to build power, weaken our opponents and prepare ourselves for the next surge. This person was a senior correspondent at the New African in 2014. Ah, yeah. Co-founder of the political group Momentum in 2015. <laughs> yeah. The guy's going to be £50 lighter next week. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. There we go. James Schneider's book. Oh, Our block, oh, how we good. win. <laughs> did you get into any plagiarism scandals and write any, any of the books either of you? Or, uh, no, for, you for, fortunately not. No, no Rachel Reeves problems there. <laughs> I think you did pretty well on that, actually, I have to say. Yeah, there's nothing more depressing, though, than walking into a pound shop and seeing your books. <laughs> <laughs> I'd only published it the week before. That was what made it even worse. Christ, I've only just had the party. <laughs> You had a party, that's the main thing. Yeah, that's true. That's and you've got true. eyes in the book. Yeah. Everyone likes a bargain. <laughs> um, thank you both very, Thanks much. very much. Thanks for Thanks for being good sports on the quiz <laughs> as well. Much appreciated. That is it from us uh, tonight. We will see you on Monday at 7pm, unless there's an emergency politics hub tomorrow. Uh, up next, it is SJ with the UK tonight. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. We'll see you on Monday.